Thank you. I'm really honored to be asked to uh, talk on this forum with such a distinguished list of speakers that you have every year. Um, first, I'd like to thank New South Books for publishing my manuscript. I, I don't know how many of you uh, realize that Montgomery has a real jewel in having this press in the city. Uh, the, the range of books that they publish is, is extraordinary, uh, covering literature and history and folklore. Uh, they, were, they were really wonderful people to work with. While I was working on this book on civil rights in the Methodist Church, I didn't think very much about the implications this study would have on racial ethnic separation in our own time. But recent events of the past two years have changed my mind, unfortunately. While overt racism is perhaps not as prevalent in the United States today as it was in the 1950s and 60s, we still encounter and are challenged by acts of discrimination today, not only toward African Americans, but other groups that are different from white mainstream cultural and religious beliefs. Some of you, like myself, were relatively young at a time when the system of racial segregation by law was be being challenged by one of the great social movements of American history, the Civil Rights Movement. Regardless of where we might have been in the American South, the majority of, of white citizens had come to accept racial separation as a given fact, going back at least to the turn of the 19th century. This system of racial apartness governed our lives in a comprehensive way, from the denial of the right to vote to African Americans, to such venues as separate waiting rooms in bus and train stations, to school rooms, to even drinking fountains. I'm sure that some of you, if you happen to grow up here, remember and can tell of the discrimination you saw in our area in the, at that time. Any challenge to this system seemed to be politically impossible, but in 1954, the whole apparatus of legal separation of the races slowly began to come apart with a landmark decision by the United States Supreme Court which ruled the previous construct of separate but equal was not equal and therefore unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. That beginning in the courts inspired black leadership and some courageous white politicians to use both the legal system and, and mechanisms and the mechanisms of sit-ins, consumer boycotts, and street demonstrations to dismantle the segregation system during the next 15 years. I studied all of this political and social history as part of my graduate education at Tulane University, but I was unaware of the turmoil which desegregation created within the major Christian denominations of the time. After all, one might assume that these institutions of faith and Christian ethics would wholeheartedly condemn a system that denied the brotherhood of all human beings in the eyes of God and were quite inconsistent with the Sermon on the Mount. As I began my college teaching career at the Methodist-related Birmingham Southern, my own naivete was revealed as I talked to various church leaders about their reaction to the civil rights movement. I learned that all of the Protestant denominations were themselves segregated in practice through various structural mechanisms before World War II and that the idea that African Americans might actually become a part of their local membership was unthinkable. After all, the vast majority of African Americans in the nation had before and since the Civil War separated into their own denominations. The assumption was among whites that they were seemingly satisfied with keeping that segregation in place. But this approach soon revealed a blindness 
that became increasingly obvious. If black Americans were now to be given their full rights of citizenship, did it mean that the church as an institution would remain the most segregated place in the nation on Sunday mornings? What did that say about the essential message of Christ in Christianity? Was there anything in the scriptures to justify a separate but equal in the church pews? Or did it follow, as the Supreme Court had said, that separation of the races was inherently unequal? Also, I found that within the area of church practice, there was actually a further disparity, as many faithful and active Christians actually believed that the presence of African Americans within their ranks would fundamentally change their social milieu in ways that were harmful to the church and themselves. Here's where it seemed to me the crux of the problem lay. The traditions that had sustained American churches for nearly 150 years included the belief that to introduce biracial participation at the communion table would lead to dire consequences for their congregations. Who could share the cup with a black person when they were disinclined to enter a newly integrated hotel or restaurant or share a public restroom with that same person? My interest in examining this dilemma in the context of social change in the 1960s led me to attempt a scholarly examination of one Methodist conference in the northern half of Alabama. Whereas many of the comprehensive studies of the civil rights movement concentrated on the movement at a national or regional level, what I really wanted to do was to flesh out the real story of religion and race at a grassroots local level. I also wanted to give the segregationists their day in court to examine their own theological defenses of racial segregation and see what arguments from that point of view might warrant serious consideration. Let me emphasize that the debate that was occurring in the Methodist Church in regard to possible integration of both races into membership was parallel to some degree or other in the other powerful Protestant denominations in, Al in the Alabama of the 1950s and 1960s. That would include the Southern Presbyterians, the Southern Baptist, the Episcopal, and the Episcopal Diocese of Alabama. What made the Methodists stand out was that of the four populist Protestant denominations, they were on, the only ones to actually incorporate African Americans into their institutional structure by the end of the 1960s. The world of Methodism once looked like this as a result of reorganization in 1939. There was a central conference nationwide which was all black. And there were five regional all-white conferences, sorry, jurisdictions, I should have said, let me start that sentence over. There was a central jurisdiction nationwide, which was all black. And there were five regional all-white jurisdictions stretching from California to the East Coast, confining all black churches in the Methodist Church to one jurisdiction effectively kept the races very much apart. After the 1954 Supreme Court decision, the General Assembly of the United Methodist Church, by majority vote, determined to do away with the Central Conference. It began carefully by creating a series of study commissions on integration. Southern Methodists had no doubt that the church was moving toward a mandate to eliminate the central jurisdiction and incorporate its churches geographically within the existing white conferences. The real vision of the Methodist presiding bishop and the Council of Bishops was to arrive at a point by 1968 where clergy of either race served African American and white members of the same congregation. This struggle in Alabama became the focus of my book, and the story proved to be a dramatic one. The denomination included within its membership some of the most important segregationists in the state, 
Governor George Wallace, Police Commissioner Bull Connor in Birmingham, and Robert Shelton, the Imperial Wizard of the United Clans of America. Added to these figures were many important businessmen, lawyers, judges, mayors, legislators, in essence, the most important members of the Alabama power establishment. For a starter, I knew that most of the conference print sources in Birmingham Southern College archives would not be the main sources for my book. Official church publications barely conveyed the heat that the debate over integration generated within the church. The official newspaper of the conference, the Alabama Christian Advocate, carefully printed safe articles and sidestepped the issue of integration in the church. Uh, when I was doing my research, I noted that there were many, many articles in the Advocate uh, on Methodist missions to Africa, but very, very few articles which discussed local black Methodist churches in Alabama. So I decided I had to be go, go beyond the print sources, and I began a series of interviews with Methodist ministers and lay leaders that took me well beyond the archives. To my surprise, I found, found that many persons I approached were very willing to talk to me about their memories of the period from the early 1960s through the 1970s. I think that their experiences during this time were so profound that they were unforgettable. In Alabama, the push for merger was an uphill battle for those ministers who opposed segregation. To speak out on behalf of integration was to risk professional ruin and the probability that one should begin looking for a ministerial post outside the South. Quote, if your preacher doesn't preach segregation from his pulpit, one Methodist recommended, you cut a his salary to a dollar a year and sell his parsonage. Let me give you an idea of the enormity of opposition to ending the Central Conference in the state. In 1957, the National Methodist Church sent a National Study Commission to Montgomery for a series of hearings in which about 80 Southern laity were able to express their opinions on merger, and this is the word that the church used. Instead of integration, they used the word merger. It was a kind of a, a, safer, a safer word to use. A number of interviewees warned the commissioners that abolishing the central jurisdiction would result in a mass walkout by thousands of Methodists. The forces of segregation within Alabama Methodism were often active in local white citizens' councils uh, committed to stopping public school desegregation. The politics of race emerged in the successful campaigns of George Wallace and Bull Connor, both Methodist by denomination. The most powerful challenge to change within the church came from an organization formed by two Alabama circuit judges, the Methodist Layman's Union. In preparation for a statewide meeting at Highlands Methodist Church in Birmingham, the group privately published an informational booklet they called a pronouncement. This somewhat slick little pamphlet is a window into the mindset of church-going segregationists. For a historian like myself, it served as a gold mine in deciphering what the scriptural context was for defending segregation. The real enemy in the external world to the authors was the United States Supreme Court and its 1954 decision which implied that the South was unchristian and even sinful. Other enemies came from within the church itself, including Methodist Church youth literature out of Nashville, which included pictures of black and white children taking communion at the altar, Emory University theology professors who supported school desegregation, and above all, the actions of the General Assembly, which were seen as dictatorial in de defining segregation as a sin. A significant portion of the booklet described the undesirable social consequences of integration within the church, 
especially the, quote, commingling of the races at marriage ceremonies, hikes, swimming meets, and the social functions of the Methodist Youth Fellowship. The, quote, typical Negro in Alabama was by nature, quote, volatile and raucous. It contended that at least 60% of them at a function in the church or a private home would render the gathering completely intolerable, end quote. The Methodist Layman Union publication outlined what they believed to be the biblical and theological foundations of segregation. According to Genesis, God had made the various races accordingly and, quote, placed them in separate areas on this planet. God had repeatedly admonished Abraham to protect the Israelites' racial purity. The Old Testament injunctions against intermarriage strictly forbade matrimony between the races. In the New Testament, the Good Samaritan was intended to demonstrate that God, uh, sorry, that Christ never confused Christian brotherhood with the true mixing of Jews and Samaritans. God in his plans for human progress would not wish to, quote, mongrelize the infinite life process. Here the argument was shifted from the Bible to southern plantations and ranches. No breeder of stock in southern agriculture would intentionally downbreed his herds. Therefore, white families were just as concerned to avoid downbreeding their children and grandchildren. These are some uh, obvious misreadings of the Bible. The separate sphere influence, or sorry, the separate, in spirit, separate spirit argument is undermined by the fact that European slave traders brought Africans against their will to the, to the New World and undid the spears themselves. The Old Testament arguments against intermarriage separated people on the basis of religion, not race, since Jews and other peoples of the region were all Semitic. And although the parable of the Good Samaritan does acknowledge ethnic issues in the time of Jesus, it does not exclude Samaritans from conversion to Christianity. Indeed, the message of the New Testament seems to be inclusion and not exclusion. In my book, I offer many examples of the very effective battles the forces of segregation fought to stave off union in the Methodist structure of white and black churches. These tactics included demands from any white that any white pastor advocating integration be exiled from the conference to pastorates outside the South. And this dis did occur to a number of outspoken ministers. Many, church, many Methodist churches stopped using Methodist youth literature from Nashville and substituted Sunday school materials from the Southern Baptist Convention. Especially prevalent in the 1950s was the charge that those in favor of union were either members of the Communist Party or directed to carry on their integrationist activities directly from the Soviet Union. Methodist church camps were closed to black children. A number of churches announced that they would use forcible ejection if any black person attempted to enter their sanctuaries for Sunday service. Said one usher, quote, I will shoot the first black person who enters my church. Perhaps the most unfortunate of the ministerial targets in North Alabama was a fiery little minister, the Reverend John Rutland, who had Bull Connor in his Birmingham congregation in Woodlawn. And Connor would regularly get up during the sermon and storm out shouting at Rutland to leave off his so-called N-word preaching. It was no coincidence that the Rutland family found themselves subject to Klan visits at night and had fiery crosses lit on their lawn. Most importantly, the two Alabama bishops of this time in the 1950s and early 60s, Bachman Hodge and Nolan Harmon, either tried to ignore the strife within their denomination or to please the segregationist by responding positively to their demands. Hodge exiled one outspoken minister to a missionary post in South Africa, 
and he relocated two others in New York and Boston. As for Rutland, he said, I don't know where I could send John. <laughs> the next bishop, Nolan Harmon, laid the blame for violence in Alabama during the early 1960s on outside agitators and proclaimed that integration could only occur at a very slow pace because it clashed with the customs of the South. In 1963, Harmon helped draft and sign the letter from the seven most important church leaders in Birmingham, pleading with Martin Luther King Jr. not to bring his passive resistance demonstrations to Birmingham, but to allow local authorities to try to work out the immense hostility between blacks and whites in the city. Uh, and of course the response to this was the famous letter from the Birmingham jail, which was addressed specifically to, to those ministers. It's important to note that both Hodge and Harmon had very traditional southern backgrounds in their developmental years. Harmon, a native of Virginia, proclaimed his hero as Robert E. Lee, and he often used Lee's career as an example in his sermons. The most important issue to both these bishops was the possibility that important Methodist churches might split off from the denomination with the result that a totally separate Southern Methodist church might emerge. Financial fallout was a strong and real factor in their desire to avoid conflict. But in 1964, in 1964, the southeastern jurisdiction elected four new bishops, and one of these, W. Kenneth Goodson, was assigned to Alabama. Goodson, a graduate of Duke Theological Seminary, was just 51 when he moved his family to Birmingham to take up residence. His own background was modest. His father had been a railroad engineer in North Carolina, and he came from a family of eight children. His physical and mental energy differed greatly from his two elderly predecessors. His approach to his job was certain to make him popular and an effective church leader. Not content to stay in his office. Uh, as a matter of fact, Harmon had not even lived in uh, Birmingham as a resident. Uh, he had another uh, conference up in uh, uh, North Carolina, and so he uh, stayed in the Tuttle Hotel when he performed his, his uh, duties as bishop. But Goodson moved his whole his whole family uh, to Birmingham. He began to undertake a crowded schedule of Sunday morning sermons, the dedication of church buildings, and stewardship campaigns. He was keenly aware of the importance of the media and Goodson began a series of weekly half-hour radio programs that later were expanded to television. Goodson would give a short sermon, and then a choir made up of ministers from the two conferences would sing. He was constantly on the move throughout backcountry Alabama, and he reported his visits to small and large churches in his, quote, bishop, Bishop's Corner, column in the Alabama Christian Advocate. He particularly enjoyed supper on the lawn after his sermons. The onlookers were surprised to see the bishop, who had a tremendous appetite, polish off the apple pie before he tried the fried chicken and ubiquitous, before he tried the, the fried chicken and ubiquitous Methodist congealed salads. I love that finding because that's all I remember from my Methodist childhood were those congealed salads. <laughs> and I'm sure you remember them too. Quite an amazing variety. Goodson tried to answer every personal letter that he received, and his replies displayed a style that was graceful, witty, and very lively. To a parishioner who complained that an Alabama minister had appeared on the Johnny Carson show and sang a song about beer and pretzels, Goodson said, well, maybe the, that song is not my kind of music, but I think we ought to give each other a degree of freedom in our expression. To another writer who had heard that a North Carolina conference had given a million dollars to Martin Luther King, 
Goodson responded, quote, that conference has never given a million dollars for anything, including sin and salvation. <laughs> All his listeners commented on the exceptional quality of Goodson's sermons. He peppered his sermons with real experiences from his own life, and he was a natural Southern storyteller with a good measure of humor added in. He had developed a speaking style that had certain old-fashioned vocal mannerisms, and you might remember this from your own ministers when you were growing up. He would bear down on the letter G to emphasize such words as glory or God, and he used such King James English expressions as yea or verily. Sometimes his sentences were quite florid, as in, and I'm quoting the whole sentence here, we have come to talk about some things we ought to talk about and remember some things we ought to remember and to resolve never to forget some things we ought never to forget. <laughs> As one ministerial friend remarked, his sermons were always an event and you didn't want to preach anywhere anytime soon after you went somewhere where he had just fell for hell forth. During his first months in Alabama, Goodson became aware that he was in a state that was in the middle of significant racial crisis. Younger progressive ministers were at first not sure that a bishop who seemed to rely so much on personal charm would confront the racial divide very energetically. But they were quite surprised when Goodson began to make removal of racial division the top priority in his conferences. The heart of my book is an examination of the tactics he used to overcome the segregationist phalanx within the denomination. First, I think it's important to point out that Goodson was born into a culture in central North Carolina where racial prejudice was not a part of his upbringing. His own modest beginnings allowed him to achieve a reputation for treating African Americans with fairness and consideration before he came to Alabama. His spiritual beliefs on the matter were expressed very clearly. Quote, I believe in a social order which has to be based on the teachings of Jesus Christ. He realized that the church could only change if younger clergy who were inclined to support racial union were given positions of importance. So during his eight years in Alabama, he appointed more than 40 new district superintendents, most of whom were young ministers in their early 30s or 40s. In March 1965, Goodson was dedicating a new church in Selma when the county posse led by Sheriff Jim Clark attacked a group of civil rights workers who were beginning a march from Selma to Montgomery on behalf of voting rights. On the way home, uninvited, he stopped off in Montgomery and arranged a meeting with Governor George Wallace, which he later described as simply a pastoral call. <laughs> he, expressed, he expressed to Wallace his disapproval of the violence that had occurred on the Selma Bridge and urged the governor to allow the march to take place. Now, I don't think that's the reason Wallace actually allowed it. I think it was pressure from the Kennedy administration, embarrassment over national publicity, which was not very favorable to what had happened, that caused him to change his mind. But Goodson maybe was a part of that thinking. Upon reaching home, Goodson called a meeting of important Methodist clergy and lay leaders and ask them to support a strong statement on racial justice. According to those present, Goodson wept as he described the effect that the Selma violence had had on him. The result was a pastoral letter that went out to all Methodist churches in the state the next Sunday and was read from all those church pulpits. It used a key word for Goodson, reconciliation. From his perspective, the Methodist Church in Alabama must admit its part in the sin of racism and become, quote, an instrument of healing the wounds that have been chronic in our society. To this end, Goodson put the authority of his office and the church squarely behind voter registration of blacks 
and the realization of full civil rights for all Americans. During the remainder of his bishopric in Alabama, Goodson worked very strategically to comply with the National Church's mandate for the dissolution of the central jurisdiction and absorption into the white conferences. He invited black ministers from the Alabama Central Conference to participate in a pastor's retreat in South Alabama in 1965, but he didn't invite them to spend the night. Quote, I wish we could tell them to come along for the whole school, but I guess we better flavor the soup a little bit before we serve it in its entirety. Goodson was careful to maintain dialogue with Methodists who were segregationists, and he never stopped believing that he could win them over with a dinner here and there, a golf game here and there. But he forged ahead. In 1968, Goodson was appointed bishop of the Alabama Central Conference, and he immediately invited the four black district superintendents and their wives to a buffet supper at his home in Vestavia, along with the white district superintendents. When one of the black superintendents served his plate and started toward the back porch to eat, Goodson stopped him and asked him to offer the blessing. The man was so moved by this that he could not speak and somebody else had to pray over the food. Such a clear statement of racial openness would probably have been unthinkable to any of his predecessors in the post. This is not to say that Goodson's efforts to promote racial harmony succeeded at first. On the first vote in North Alabama to eliminate racial segregation in the church, the measure was defeated by a vote of 339 to 312. This caused Goodson to redouble his efforts by establishing joint committees from all the Alabama conferences. He invited 500 Methodists from across the state to meet in a series of integrated bishops' convocations to discuss the social mission of the church. And he was careful to involve women lay leaders, many of whom were far more sympathetic to union than their male counterparts. In fact, it was the women's organizations who led the way in integrating the Methodist summer camp at Sumatonga, as well as other church meetings that occurred there. Goodson was careful to take the top leaders of the Central Conference into his innermost circle, and he listened to the advice of the two most important black leaders in the Methodist Church in Alabama, Joseph Lowry and Charles Hutchinson. In the end, Goodson and his lieutenants organized dialogue groups to go out to as many churches as possible to present the case for merger in an unthreatening manner. A strategic decision was made to assure the congregations that the new organizational structure would not affect the appointment of pastors. The final vote on merger occurred in June 1971 as the North Alabama Conference convened in an inadequately air-conditioned auditorium on this Birmingham Southern campus. The air was in fact very tense as the various delegates rose to spoke for or against dismantling the organizational racial divide. When the votes were, were tallied, the delegates had approved the merger plan by only one vote, 424 for and 423 against. Goodson was so frightened at the razor thin closeness of the, closeness of the vote that he had the tellers count them again with the same result. But then in the typical show of confidence, and this is pure Kenneth Goodson, he went ahead to announce the vote and he said to the conference, it's passed, it doesn't make any difference if it was one vote or a thousand. The accomplishment of merger was in many ways his personally. He had provided a process of racial conciliation that had shifted a considerable body of his bishopric toward acceptance that the church would not be divided by race. Only a year and a half remained to him in Alabama, and as he prepared to depart for a new appointment, he commented on how he had benefited from knowing the plight of African Americans in Alabama during his service in Birmingham. The most important outcome to him 
was that they could now hear our preachments on brotherhood and human dignity and believe them. Thank you. And, and make sure make sure I can hear your question because I'm half I'm half deaf. Some of us who lived through this story in the 1960s believe that the Methodist Church is doing it all over again now in regards to the issue of homosexuality in the church. What lessons do you think should be learned from your story that has some uh, application today? Yeah. Um, that's it. Oh, the question is, uh, some of us who lived through this, through this period uh, believe that the, the same kind of process of, of uh, opposition is going uh, on in, in terms of uh, opposition to um, uh, homosexuality, yeah, homosexuality in, in the church today, and it certainly is within the Methodist Church. Uh, what do you think we could, we could learn from, from my study? That might might apply to the situation today. Well, one is one thing is that um, if there are a couple of things. One is it was shown that the theological, the scriptural defenses for segregation, as outlined in the pronouncement, were in quite, in fact, quite weak, uh, and it was a twisting of certain scriptures. Uh, to show one thing that people who were segregationists wanted to show, but if you look at them on the face of when they were written and what they were intended to do, um, this was a misuse of the scriptures. I think I think that's a, that's a possibility. The second, and this is really uh, I suppose pretty obvious from Goodson's success. Um, Goodson believed in, in a process of reconciliation in which both sides talked to each other and tried to reach a common ground. If there was not a common ground, uh, then he still didn't reject that other side. So that I, I think his idea was to find some kind of workable solution. And there's a significant um, compromise made here in that before uh, the vote was taken, um, Methodists were assured that they were probably not going to have a black pastor appointed to lead their congregation. So I think there has to be some kind of give and take and I don't know a whole lot of, about your issue from a scholarly, a scholarly point of view, but I do think that the Episcopal Church has probably reached a point about as good as it's going to get in that they have essentially a kind of local option uh, system, whereas a church decides in and of itself with consultation with the bishop uh, as to whether they're going to bless same-sex marriages or whatever, but it's left up to the local congregation in accord with the bishop, and the bishops really have somewhat con uh, control over that process. I, I think the notion of homosexuality should not be confused with homosexuality. Homosexuality is a racial oh, I agree, and, and we're dealing with race on one hand and, per, and life it's preference. Totally different. Yeah. And it's not, con it's not conflict. No. Uh, I went to a Methodist college uh, in Mississippi, Rust College, Bill Saps, of course, and played black folks at the time when I was in college. The white Methodist conferences in Mississippi had promised to do, help Rust College build a gymnasium. But when the president of Rust College uh, an ordained Methodist minister uh, allowed the civil rights workers to come on campus and stay, eat in the cafeteria. The conference just refused to give any money at all toward 
of the building of, and this is in the 60s now. Mm -hmm. uh, the church did not move expeditiously at all because it was not in 1964, we had the Civil Rights Act, uh, outlawing discrimination. The church did not move in front of those, those actions, it seems to me. Neither the Seventh day Adventist Church, which I'm a member of, and many other churches did not move. The Methodist Church has one conference that was, when I was in Mississippi, we had what we called the Upper Mississippi Conference, uh, an all black conference in the Methodist Church. Now, that, that has changed in certain extent. But I don't think the church moved as it should have moved if we were going to be a witness of Christ in the, in, in the world. It did not do that, uh, it seems to me. And neither the Methodists, the Methodists are not quite as bad as the Southern Baptists. <laughs> but, but, I think we all have to stand before them. All right. Well, let me let me respond. I don't know about Mississippi. That's not part of my field. But what happened in Alabama was that uh, Goodson thought, many people thought, left before, had to leave before he can completed his task. And then the next bishop was much more retrogressive, slowed things down, and uh, probably Goodson was disappointed in the pace at which uh, integration occurred, but on the other hand, I don't think that they would that the the process of merger in Alabama would have gotten anywhere uh, without the presence of Goodson. So the key to this, and he's sort of the hero in my book, is 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 Goodson, who was able to bring a very inclusive uh, and open uh, approach to trying to bring both sides together. And also I think another factor here is, uh, uh, I'm sorry to say it because I'm an old guy now, but uh, the presence of young people in, in, lead, in leadership roles, in appointed re leadership roles. And by the time those 40 district superintendents who were relatively young were in place, then you had a great momentum. So if you kept the, old, the same old establishment, in 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 control uh, that it existed before Goodson, I don't think you would have seen a favorable vote for integration. Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, the question that I have regards the intersection between religion and politics, and there were, I'm sure, at that time, in that time of uh, frame that you have there, the 20 years span. Um, various kinds and types of religious representation in political government. Has there been any talk of revision of ordinances, city ordinances, of the state constitution that would help fortify this reconciliation? I, I, I can't. I can't address that because really. I, I, none of the people I talked to or, or the papers I saw had even mentioned the state constitution. What they were really involved in was uh, the, the national civil rights movement and the presence of civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King and, and uh, Shuttlesworth and others. And how did the church, how did the church deal with that, that kind of, of um, would I say, uh, the crisis on the streets in, in, in the sermons that were delivered and in the, in the, uh, the, the comments on the, social, on the social order that the that ministers made. But uh, as far as the politics involved, it's only with people like um, Bull Connor and, and George Wallace that you get any commentary on, on political issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm speaking from profound ignorance here, and I know it's outside your, your uh, time period, but I'm just curious how how uh, how, how integrated, in fact, United Methodist churches are now. Yeah, how integrated is the United Ch uh, Methodist Church now? Certainly not to the extent that the that the leadership and Goodson uh, thought would exist in terms of. Um, uh, in, uh, interracial congregations, 
uh, across the board. But there are a number of churches that are integrated. I do not have statistics on that because I, I didn't go that far. But I do know that the first black bishop of the Southeastern Conference was here in South Alabama. South Alabama West Florida Conference had, had the first black bishop. And so that was an impressive achievement to me, because South Alabama, of which I am not an expert, what went on here was in many ways very different um, in terms of the, of the population. Uh, but South Alabama had been much more reluctant uh, to approve merger than North Alabama. So I'd say there's been progress, but not nearly the progress that... Um, that the church leadership wanted to occur. What, uh, what happened to Bishop Goodson? Was he in kicked upstairs? Well, no, he took on an, another bishopric, bishopric in North Carolina, and that was much more to his, that was near his home, and that, and that was home to him. And so I think people here were, were very sad to see him leave because they weren't sure what would come next. And what did come next was a bishop by the name of Carl Sanders, who actually was not in favor of the merger of the churches, uh, the black and white churches, and slowed down the process quite a bit. And did not work with the real leaders, Joseph Rowell, uh, Lowry and, and Hutchinson. Both of those people, who were the most important black ministers in the state, decided to leave the state. They were not appointed to the new cabinet. They were not given positions of uh, authority within uh, the state uh, Methodist uh, uh, order. Instead, uh, Sanders appointed a guy as a district superintendent, the first dis black, dis super black district superintendent who nobody, no one had ever heard of. And so they left the state. And Lowry, of course, ended up very importantly as a, with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And then later on, you know, gave, what, the prayer at the Obama inauguration? Question? Sorry, back. I'm sorry, I got a question from back here. The answer to that is rel relatively not in North Alabama. I, I think people, to some extent, uh, I would say there was uh, there were uh, there were not many places they wished to go. They didn't wish to become Southern Baptist, where it was clear at that stage there was no going to be no movement toward integration. But they did sim they simply did not <laughs> they did one, not want to become Baptist. And the Presbyterians uh, were debating this issue, so there was no question. There was, there was uh, uh, no one knew how that was going to turn out. The Episcopalians were firmly at that time uh, in favor of racial segregation of congregations according to race, even though they had um, no real separate structure for black churches. Uh, the Episcopals, particularly Bishop Carpenter in Alabama, uh, was absolutely opposed to any kind of integration. So I don't think the Methodists, if if they had a lot, you know, wanted uh, an alternative, the alternatives were not good for them. I'm sure they lost some people, but but nothing like thousands, as was predicted. Okay, more questions. I'd like I'd like for just to have questions if I could right now, and then if we have time for statements, that's fine. But let me get people who want to ask some questions. Of us as a people in our community might be, uh, even today, 
not one white person out of many that I approached to contribute to that church didn't give some. Mm -hmm. Some wanted to do it anonymously, that's fine. In their hearts, everybody I called on, and I don't know how many people are getting some to rebuild that church. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's wonderful. I think that's wonderful, but we, we cannot fall into the traps, so to speak, that occurred in the 1950s, which was that the, the white Methodist church was contributing a lot of money to black colleges, uh, missions to Africa, as a way of telling themselves that they were doing a good thing. But in actuality, they're help, you know, they're, in the end, they're preserving the separation. So um, that's that's what I found in my research that that one of the ways in which people argued against integration was to say, look how much we're doing for uh, Rust College, or look how much we're doing for Miles, or whatever, and then it was it was stopped there. So I'm, I think you know what you're describing is a, a great thing, but that could be a way to avoid integration as well. Thanks. And I'll, I'll go out there and sign anybody's book for free.